All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started this afternoon. It's a couple of minutes after after seven, uh, so we'll get everything kicked off. Uh, tonight, we'll uh, we'll start off with a couple of introductions there. I don't know if you can see see screens on the side there, but one that we want to make sure we introduce as a new member to the Pig Brig team is Kayla Jackson. Uh, Kayla's been with us about a month now, so uh, she's come on board to help us out on the education side and uh, and to help out with governmental agencies and things like that, getting some things in place that that will help out with those bigger um, contracts, those bigger bigger holders that that that. Uh, state agencies will do a lot of work with with Kayla directly. Uh, obviously, we got Marshall with us, and Marshall's with us all the time, every every month. Uh, Marshall's going to help us with uh, the moderation of the questions, and uh, and obviously is going to be answered some of those questions as we get to the end. Uh, Ryan Rotes is with us again. Ryan has been uh, with White Buffalo over the over the winter, and uh, I think tonight's the first time he's been able to go the last six months without wearing a coat. So I think he's enjoying this time. Uh, a few of the other ones that we have got there on behind the scenes and and. Uh, Pig Brig tonight that are joining us is Amanda. That's it's in Florida. She's with us most nights, and 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 uh, Brooke, our our marketing guru, is is behind the scenes as well. So, what we'll do tonight to to kind of kick things off the same way that we do every every month is we want to make sure that you're aware of how we answer questions as we go through these webinars. And what we'll do is is uh, is as we're going through any questions that pop up that you want to ask is we want you to, to put them into that chat or the Q&A feature. Uh, if you look where your toolbar is on that chat, uh, top, bottom, wherever it happens to pop up on your device, the question that I want you to answer tonight to make sure that you understand how that chat feature works, uh, where those, those uh, questions are going to be coming in at is, tonight answer the question for me is, where are you currently seeing the most pig damage in the area that you're at? So uh, a couple of words in there, just slap that in there. If it's agriculture fields, if it's timber, if it's crops, uh, whatever that may be, let us know right now in the last six or so weeks, within the last six weeks or so, where are you seeing the biggest pig damage and put that into the chat for us. Uh, that kind of gives us an idea in the spring of the year uh, where most of your damage is at. That helps us better be uh, help you uh, as those questions come in. Give us a little bit more of a pulse of what's happening. Uh, so those answers are coming in pretty quickly. That's good. That's what we want to hear, what we want to see. So what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and go into the, the, the upcoming webinars. Next month is going to be fun. Uh, one of the biggest statements that I have everywhere I go around the planet is the, the comment that people say, man, my pigs are different. Well, next month, we're going to be discussing about the, the, the differences among pigs and, and where we may be seeing some differences that, that, that could occur or it could be just something that you may think that happens. But we're going to get into that pretty deep. And, uh, and and basically bring up the some of the old science lessons that we had back in in, in school. So uh, one of the things I want to get to the point of really quickly here on this upcoming webinars is we have something extremely special that's going to be coming up uh, for you in, in June. We're still going to have the June webinar that you'll see on the screen where, where it says summer heat cools off feral hogs. We're going to have a second event in June on June the 28th. It's going to air at noon or 11 o'clock, 11 a.m., 11 a.m. Central Time. And the reason it's going to be airing at 11 a.m. Central Time is that guest speaker for that second event in June on the 28th is Dr. Carl Grimsey. Uh, Carl works for the German Forestry Association, and he is the, the spearhead of what's going on with African swine fever eradication in Germany, where Pig Brig is the sole trapping collaborator with the German government, German Forestry Association, and getting ahead of that that uh, that swine fever concern that's there. We'll talk a little bit more specifically about this closer to the end of the event. That's going to be super uh, uh, interesting to hear what Carl's got to say about a a a, a countrywide trapping effort uh, where they do a lot of saturation trappings and they exclusively do tree sets, not using any post at all. So that's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, for those of you that can't join us that, that early in the day, I understand it's early, but there is a seven-hour time difference from where Carl is to where we're at, and we don't want Carl staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning uh, to present for us. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we come, come to the end of this, this event. Uh, but tonight what we're going to be talking about is something that we really should be doing no matter uh, what focus we have in our day-to-day -day activities whether that's pigs or if it's your daily job or just managing what needs to happen in your family. But we need to make sure we have plans. We need to make sure that we have something that we can we can um, look back on to see if we can gauge successes, if we can see where we need to change things, things of that nature. But tonight we're going to talk about prepping and planning your pig rig year. 
And uh, with that, first things first is is you, you you have to take records. Whatever whatever form of record keeping you find to be the most efficient for you, uh, we need to exhaust that record keeping ability uh, to the point of writing down things that you may not think is anywhere close to important. Uh, because sometimes those those I guess those um, secondary thoughts become paramount. Uh, maybe a couple of years down the road. So when we start thinking about records. First and foremost is what I'd like to know whenever I'm trapping or planning my future uh, years, my future efforts is when did you have peaks and valleys in the past year, past couple of years? So did you catch more pigs? Did you see more activity during the winter time or was it during the summer? So write those downs and write those things down and let us know why you or not let not let us know, but you need to write down enough information about why you think that that was a peak. Why was it a valley? Uh, was it that it may have been a valley because you didn't catch as many pigs or was it a valley that you just didn't see any sign at all? Uh, so explain why you think that it was peaks and valleys. Uh, you want to find out where did you catch them at? And it could have been that, that, that you catch more pigs sometimes along waterways than you do out in agriculture fields. But we need to think about where you caught them. Um, and, and, and more elaboration on there could be that it was, if it was around a water source, things of that nature, what did the other environmental conditions have? Was it a drought type of the year? Um, when are you going to be available? And, and that's a big, a big situation that we need to overcome is, is whenever we're thinking about trapping pigs, if you're not available, we need to think really hard about is that the per proper time of the year that we need to be trying to catch pigs? Because I can promise you, pigs are not going to concern themselves with what your calendar looks like or what day of the week you don't really want to catch pigs. So if you're not going to be available for a certain time of the year, then, then definitely we don't need to be thinking about trapping pigs, uh, but we still need to make sure that our monitoring is in place, things of that nature. So when are you available? When can you work on those animals? The other thing, too, is that even though you might be available to catch pigs at, at certain times of the year, how much time in the day are you going to have available to catch those pigs? Because effectively using a brig, it's not uncommon for us to see 25 pigs plus in a trap and a catch. So if you go in there and you have a, a 25 pig catch, are you going to be able to have all those animals taken care of by 930 or 10 o'clock in the morning if you got other things you need to do later that day? So just because you have that day open, is, is there enough time in that day to do what we need to do? And uh, what were the conditions? Did we catch those pigs during cold fronts? Did we catch them whenever the barometric pressures were high? Uh, what did we do? What did we see with the conditions that were out there that we could start to draw some correlation to where we, we, can, we can start basing more of our trapping on previous uh, data points? So other things I'd like to, to, to see is whenever I'm catching pigs is what did you notice in the, si the, the size and the dynamics of the, of the pigs throughout the year? And this could be from one year to the next. I mean, if we start out catching pigs and it was a lot of big animals and they were um, in big sounders and so forth and you stay on those animals, did the pig size get smaller? Did the sounder dynamics change on you? And what I mean by sounder dynamics is uh, whenever whenever those juvenile boars start to get closer to being mature, those older females will typically kick those young boars out of those sounders, and you'll see some basically like teenage rogue sounders out there, for the lack of a better analogy, where those younger boars that's been ejected from that sounder are trying to find a place for their own, and they can wreak havoc. Uh, so what is those dynamics telling you about the sound, the, the sounders, the size, the, 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 the age structure of those animals in the year or in that sounder with regard to the time of the year? Uh, a lot of these will start to paint a pretty good picture for you as you move forward. The other things that I want to know whenever I'm trapping pigs is what does the data not show us? I mean, it's pretty easy to walk up to a trap and you count 15 pigs in there and it's in July and it's hot. There's no rain. I mean, that's pretty, pretty obvious thing. So what does the data not show you? Uh, so where, where are the pigs active at? I mean, we may not put down where the pigs were active. Were they, were they more active on the opposite side of the property than where you set up and you just didn't have time to move a trap? Uh, were the pigs active down the road where there was a different kind of agriculture crop that was going on? Uh, what was happening happening at locations other than where you had the trap? So did we see movement patterns shift? Did we, did we see those patterns hold true for a longer period of time? Did they start in there in June and stay in the same location until August? We need to know those kinds of things moving forward. Uh, the other things that I want to know is were the females bred or were they lactating? 
Um, if those females are bred, what's going to happen is that, that as that female occupies an area, just research is what, what research tells us is that an average sounder, 15 pigs or so, something like that, their average range is going to be somewhere around 3,500 acres. We do know, though, that as those females get closer to having those pigs, they start tightening in on that range to where there's more uh, higher nutritious foods available that's got better cover, so forth and so on. So they may take that 3,500 acre area and literally get down into the last few days before having those pigs. They may be in only a 10 or 15 acre area that they're going to have those pigs and, and keep them there for the first few uh, or first week or so of their of their life. Other things that's going to I'd like to know is were those females lactating? If they're lactating, that's going to tell me that they do not want to interact with active boars. If there's boars that are territorial in that area, they're going to probably be moving more frequently because if they're lactating, they have pigs on side. If they've got little pigs on side, they do not want to interact with a breeding age boar, a mature boar. So they may keep those little pigs moving uh, far more often than what they do. So that goes into the next statement there is how often do sounders rotate in the area? Well, it could rotate based off of agriculture production. They could rotate based off the size of the pigs if those sows have pigs on side. So if you see a group of pigs, a sounder of pigs in an area or or uh, in, 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 in a very localized place there, how long is it before they rotated out of that area? The other thing is, is we'd like to try to find out what was holding them in that area. And, and if they moved out and they would say, there's no little pigs on their side, uh, there's no big boars that you're seeing in an area and the pigs just moved out. Could it be that they just exhausted the food resources in that area and they had no choice? Also, things that we need to think about, could it be that you may have caught somebody's hog dog on your camera and it ended up moving those pigs out of the area because they were active dog hunters that were in the in the region or in that area? It could be even two predators. As predators start honing in on a lactating sow with little pigs at side, all those predators out there, and when I talk about predators, I'm talking about coyotes and bobcats and things like that on pigs that are nursing. Okay, once those pigs get up past that weaning age, not many predators out there are going to do anything to them. But while those pigs are little, everything out there likes a bite of bacon bits every time they get a chance. So those sows could keep those piglets moving if they're really small, just to keep those predators off guard or uh, not being able to hone in on them. What are some of the challenges for mother wildlife? Uh, we get a we're getting a a, a very significant uptick in the number of calls that are coming in from people that, that are seeing challenges from bears. Um, uh, you're feeding pigs at a trap location and bears show up, pigs and bears don't like to be at the same party. So we, we're having some folks asking questions about what we need to do about bears. So there's some, some things that we need to keep in mind is as those pigs move further north into, uh, into new states, into new areas, they are probably going to encounter areas where uh, there's bears that were, were, were natural, were native to that landscape. So think about challenges from other wildlife and what we need to do to, to minimize those, those, those challenges. And, uh, and definitely give us a call. We can, we can talk you through that. We've got some, some things that you can put out there if bears are a situation. Uh, that may keep those bears back long enough to get those pigs caught. So write down these, these types of things. What are you seeing from other wildlife? Uh, other things that you may want to think about is, is other wildlife in mind is if you're in an area that's got a lot of squirrels, uh, sometimes those squirrels build a nest in the fall and the spring. Uh, they're looking for anything to keep those, those nests freshened up with. Um, we had had a couple of, of folks that called in last fall. I hadn't had any this spring, but called in last fall that they noticed some small Tetris-like squares missing out of there. If you all know what the game Tetris, missing some small squares out of their, their trap that were looked like they were sheared off with a pair of scissors. And basically what it was is squirrels going in there and shearing off some small sections of that net to be able to... Um, um, uh, freshen those nests up. So it might be one of those things. If you're in that area there, give us a call. We've got some things that we may be able to do uh, to, to keep those squirrels pushed back as well. So uh, moving on, multiple properties. A lot of us are could be absentee landowners, or it may be if you're in agriculture, you've got multiple lease properties that you, you grow crops on, or if you're forestry, obviously there, there could be multiple tracks that you have. If you're managing multiple properties, we need to think about what uh, we need to do to be able to maximize that catch of, uh, efficiencies. In the spring of the year is 
some of those times a year, we need to be thinking about what we're going to do in the summertime. I can tell you this. I would much rather do drive T-post in the spring of the year when the ground's soft more so than in July whenever it's hard as concrete. So if I'm thinking about multiple properties, I know I'm going to need to catch pigs on those multiple properties. Set your post in the spring of the year. Even if the pigs aren't there, if your records tell you that you, you're going to have a pig problem there in the summertime, Go ahead and foreshadow that issue and get those posts set in place or locate your trees and trim, trim up branches and things like that where you can make a, a tree set really quickly. So think about that. Set those posts, get those trees cleaned up, cleaned up. Other things that we do we like to see happen is using sham nets. And what we basically think talking about with a sham net is just that we put something up there that's fake that we can do like a if you if for those of you that put uh, uh, owl effigies like plastic owl effigies in your in your pecan orchards to keep your your crows and your squirrels back same situation with a sham net is you put your T post up and uh, and about four of those ten T posts zip tie you a black trash bag on about four of those uh, those T posts and and the wind moving those trash bags around will will create strange sights, strange smells, noises, things like that. Those pigs will click quickly acclimate to that other movement. And then whenever you move your nets into those areas, then it's a very, very quick uh, acclimation period to those with those pigs and those nets. Uh, uh, sham nets work outstandingly well. Uh, you do not have to take the shams down whenever you hang the nets. I mean, they've gotten acclimated to it. They they can they they can stay right there uh, throughout that trapping process as, uh, and, and and then stay there obviously when you move to the, the net to the next property. Um, the other thing to think keep in mind is what is the purpose of the property? If you've got multiple properties, then is 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 all of those properties or are all of those properties under the same production? Uh, quite likely, you're going to have different production, different type focuses for each of those properties. Well, in the spring of the year, if you're planting corn on a property, it might not be the property that you need to start out trapping on if those pigs are in there on that that planted corn, because it is going to be tough to get them uh, get them to that to that bait. Whereas if it's winter time and it's before you start planting corn, that's the property we probably need to focus on. Get those pigs hammered pretty hard before we start putting those planters in the field. Whereas if you've got corn that's going in the ground and, and planting, think about some of the other properties that may be further away that those pigs are, are actively responding to feed. But what's the purpose of that property? Where are you at in that production cycle? And, and and plan accordingly. Other things are water resources are available, and this is something we're going to be seeing more importantly uh, when we get into the into the summertime. Uh, right now, there is just a plethora of, of resources out there with a cornucopia of food on the landscape uh, for those pigs to 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 gorge themselves on and recover from that. I guess that winter slough of nutrition. But whenever we start getting into the summertime. We need to think about water, okay? We need to think about that's what those pigs are going to gravitate to. And whenever it's hot, whenever it's dry, they can't sweat. They're going to be looking for mud to keep the bugs off of them. So we need to think about time of the year, what the resources are that's available and uh, and, and getting into those areas accordingly uh, without blowing those pigs out. This is something to keep in mind. If you know you're going to have to be trapping around water in the summertime, don't wait till the summertime to drive those posts around those water areas or those, those moist areas because you could blow your pigs out of there. Go ahead and get those posts set in place. Identify your trap locations now whenever those animals may not be congregated around there very heavily then you can go in there a lot quieter, a lot more stealthy in the, in the summertime and not blow them out of those, those areas uh, that you're trying to trap. Uh, moving on to the next thing, thinking about agriculture. All right, what are the agriculture, what, what's the primary agriculture production in the area? So if we're primary ag production is in the area, it is uh, corn and there's all the planters going in the ground. I know a lot of folks are planting corn in the spring all over the, all over the South. Uh, see some very minimal response to feed uh, whenever they're trying to trap pigs. And it's just they they can they find that that corn seed planted in that row and they run those rows. Uh, it's it's kind of tough. Other things to kind of think about this time of year too is if they hadn't already started harvesting, they will be really quickly. They're on that next bullet down is is winter wheat. Um, and those 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 pigs absolutely just go crazy off that winter wheat, especially whenever it's close to harvest. And uh, you need to kind of keep in mind what that is. Other things is going to be 
um, immediately following those harvest times like that, especially with winter wheat, there's not quite as much spillage as you'd find possibly with corn harvest, is give it a couple of weeks, let those animals clean up what's what, what has been spilled, and then hit those fields within a couple of weeks after that harvest has happened because those pigs are still going to be rummaging around looking for those last bit of scraps, and you can find some extremely high success rates a couple of weeks after a harvest before those pigs blow off those fields and, uh, and go back into the thickets and things like that. Other things to keep in mind, if you're livestock producers, uh, I know if you're your cattle uh, or sheep or goats, you probably cuss the coyotes and the vultures, okay? I um, mean, uh, if you're agriculture for very long, you've probably lost little ones, kid goats and lambs and calves to, to coyotes or vultures. And there's very possibly this, the, the instance where you've even lost some of them to, to pigs as well. Whenever you have an agriculture season that you can specify when birthing is going to take place. So if you have a, a fall calving season or you have a spring calving season or kidding or lambing seasons, what I would suggest do is if you've got a pig problem, go in there prior to the birthing seasons, catch those pigs prior to birthing, prior to the livestock birthing season, and discard those pigs away from where birthing is going to occur, discard them on top of the ground. What you'll do is you'll focus those predators and those scavengers on those carcass piles, and it'll give those birth animals time to get to their feet. Some of your, your, your females that has given birth, sometimes they can be a little slow to get to their feet as well. Gives those animals a little bit of a reprieve from the coyotes and the vultures to get to their feet. And obviously we're taking animals off the, or taking pigs off the landscape that we're not having that problem. So you'll see an increase quite likely in the survivorship of your, of your livestock species just because of that. Other things that we need to keep in mind, too, is we're getting really close. If we hadn't already started seeing a few little whitetail fawns or, or your ungulate fawns, if you're in the hill country of Texas and you got a lot of exotics out there, some of those ungulate fawns may be hitting the ground as well. And they're not cheap, folks. Those are money animals. So right prior to birthing is when we really need to focus on those pig eradication efforts to keep those, those numbers as high as we can on survivorship. And then obviously what we want to do always, always is protect that water. Uh, I'm not one, I don't want to jump though over there about the, the timber production though, what timber production is active. And what I'm thinking about with timber production is that, yeah, we knew, we lose a lot of our, our large seed producing natives like your pecans and your oaks because pecan, uh, acorns and, pecan, or, and pecans are going to be highly sought after by the pigs. But what I'm talking about a little bit more on the timber production is if you're actively trying to trap in an area and they're going to come in and start thinning or clear cutting that timber, you're probably going to blow your pigs out of an area. If you don't blow those pigs out of the area, they're going to be increased in awareness as far as what they're paying attention to, what they're willing to respond to. So if you got active logging in the area, it may be the time to kind of scroll back a little bit on really trying to push those pigs to the traps and wait for that logging uh, activity to move out of the area, things to go back to ambient sounds. Another thing that's going to happen following a logging effort is you're going to have a lot of disturbed ground. Whenever that ground is disturbed, those pigs are going to come back into that disturbed ground pretty quickly after that logging is out of the area and uh, and try to take advantage of anything that's been exposed to the surface of the ground. And uh, and you'll see some of your successes go back up. But again, when you're thinking on protecting the water, don't put your traps out uh, up slope of a pond. Uh, you, if, you're, if you're leaving those traps there for prolonged periods of time and you've got those pigs defecating or urinating right there in a large uh, or in a, in a confined area with large amounts, then we don't want to try to, to, to have any contamination issues with the water, especially if we're using it as a pond to water livestock. So just kind of keep in mind where your water sources are, what's going to be using that water source, and, and definitely don't try not to trap upslope within a, within a close proximity to that water source. So other things to think about is hunting seasons. Uh, what are your neighbors doing? Uh, we get called quite often and and uh, and start asking some questions. And if you give Marshall a call or myself or Ryan or anybody a question or give us a call and start asking questions, we're probably going to turn it right back around on you and start asking you a lot of questions. Because in order for us to give you accurate suggestions or thoughts, we need to get an idea specifically of what you're facing. So we get quite often get calls in and, and people are like, man, my pigs just left me. Well, we're going to ask you a lot of questions like what's going on agriculture? wise how what's the activity that you've done at the trap has anybody been shooting at the pigs around the trap but the other question is going to be think about what your neighbors are doing uh, it could be now with the spring of the year, allowing people to get out and enjoy their their surroundings their their land and so forth. I know in some places they like to shoot skeet in the summertime and and uh, and have a good time and get out and barbecue and things like that. 
So if you're trapping pretty close to a fence line and your pigs blow out on you, and you don't know where they went. Think about what your activities of your neighbors have been. They may have been shooting. Uh, it could be that they may not have been shooting, but they're just taking their side by sides or their four wheelers and they're ripping and running and enjoying the trails and things like that. So you're going to increase your awareness depending on what your neighbors are doing. So um, we'll ask you those types of questions. OK, the other thing is, what are you going to be doing? All right. If you're going to be hunting and you're going to be enjoying the outdoors, too, if you're going to be do and doing those types of things, probably don't add things to your plate and try to take care of pigs at the same time. You need to think about it. Am I going to be cutting hay? Am I going to be planting uh, planting crops? Am I going to be harvesting? What am I going to be doing at that time of the year? And, and if you are in the, that age group that I was a couple of years ago, uh, if it's Friday night in the South, we're going to be at a football game. So we need to think about what we're going to be doing with regard to Saturday morning, what we want to do, what we don't want to do. So what will you be doing? Can you stay consistent? Can you stay on those pigs and, and not uh, uh, educate those animals, not push them into things they don't want to do? Other thing is going to be, uh, it, uh, it, uh, is, is corn always available as the go-to bait? Statistically, across the whole United States and around the world, statistically, there's nothing better than dry corn. I say that and then turn right back around and tell you this that there are definitely heavy regional preferences to baits and in, in, in across the expanse of, of um, uh, the United States. So what I mean by that is if you've got uh, peanut production in an area, pigs may walk right over the top of corn and they're wanting to go to, to peanuts. You can catch them with peanuts or peanut oil on, on top of corn, uh, where you may get into some other areas and be able to use soybeans. Uh, pigs will eat soybeans if they're accustomed to seeing those soybeans. But I can tell you this, I know a, a lot of places that if you put a soybean on the ground in front of a pig, he's going to look at you cross-eyed like you've lost your mind because they're not going to know what to do with it. They've never seen a soybean. They don't know what they don't know to eat it. Uh, same thing situation is out there too with, with the suggestions of using soybeans to keep bears back. Well, if bears have gotten acclimated to using soybeans or eating soybeans, it might not be as effective. The other thing is out there, too, is that not everywhere are soybeans going to be available to use to keep those bears pushed back. So think about what's available to you. What are you going to be able to stay consistent with? The other thing about this with using conventional baits is think about your recipes. We've talked about this in the, the webinar last fall about baiting pigs is staying consistent. If you start out conditioning pigs using a given bait, whether that's dry corn or you've got some recipe that's as long as your grandma's homemade biscuits, okay, that's something that you're going to have to stay with from the day one of conditioning to the last day of trapping because many times we change baits halfway through and we'll push those pigs back. It's just something that's that they're they're aware of the change. They may not like it. Uh, so forth and so on. Other things to keep in mind is if they leave a trap site or a bait site in, in mid conditioning or mid trapping, don't try to throw everything, including the kitchen sink at them until you can find out why they left in the first place. If you go in there and start changing up baits because the pig's leaving, you can make the situation worse. Uh, human activity is, is again too, we kind of go back to what your neighbors are doing, what you're going to be doing. Human activity, you need to stay consistent. If you're baiting at five o'clock every afternoon, you need to keep baiting at five o'clock after every afternoon. Those pigs will habituate to your behavior and they know as they hear you disappear or move out of the area from that trap site, they're going to acclimate themselves to that means there's food on the ground and we're going to come quickly. So uh, your other activities is if you're going to be um, actively engaged in cutting hay in an area that you got a pig trap in, then you need to be understanding that you're probably not going to get pigs on your game cameras until up after 10 or 11 o'clock at night after they know that you've left that field and that chance of, of uh, encountering you is gone. So uh, kind of keep an eye on what you do and what, what uh, the pigs may do in response. And they're just acting normal just based on what pressures they've been given. So Okay, so when do you do add your other strategies? All right, so the adaptability of your management. Whenever we talk about agriculture, we use the word integrated management. Whenever we talk about wildlife, we talk about adaptive management uh, because we adapt according to what the situations give us. We adapt to the climate. We adapt to what other production systems are doing like agriculture. So you need to adapt your management. One of the things that I would consider is that if you're using hunting dogs, hunting dogs are not a viable option 12 months out of the year. It can in those northern latitudes, those northern states and whatnot. It could get to the point it gets too cold in the wintertime to use dogs. They'll burn their lungs. 
Um, it could get to the point very quickly in the south where it gets too hot and those dogs will overheat too quickly and they they don't know how to stop and you'll hunt those dogs so hard they'll 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 hunt themselves to death literally. So spring and, and fall may be your only times. And I know some of you guys that are deer hunting out there want nothing to do with dogs running pigs close to deer season. And I agree with you. Uh, so spring of the year, it may be time after you've hit those pigs hard uh, through the winter and early spring that you go in there with your dogs and you clean up any of those smaller sounders that you may have started with 30 and now you got 10 pigs left. Go in there and clean up some of those pigs, those, those remaining 10 with those dogs. And they get far more efficient on you on smaller group removal, smaller sounder removal. Snares is always going to be that thing that you just basically pick your poison if you're wanting to use snares. If you're in areas that are more residential, you need to keep in mind that snare does not discriminate. Whenever we think about a snare, whatever sticks his neck in there is going to get stretched. So if you're snaring pigs, think about where you position that snare with uh, regard to the ground. We want to whenever we're snaring pigs. Pigs typically travel with their head closer to the ground, whereas deer and dogs and things like that travel with their head much higher above the ground. So setting your snares for pigs, you want to set that opening much closer to the ground where if a, a deer, a dog or something comes through there and ends up hitting that snare, one, it'll just knock it down or two, it may, if it catches anything, it'll be a leg. So positioning that snare accordingly to maximize your chance of pigs while minimizing something else. Other thing out there is shooting. Uh, if you've got thermal technologies in the spring of the year over your planted cornfields, you can do some good with those thermal technologies on smaller sounders to keep those pigs pushed back in time to get the traps in there, get them set to, to, to be able to move those, those larger groups through traps. Um, still, no matter what you do, the old tried and true deer rifle out there, yeah, we can shoot a pig or two here that makes you feel good. Uh, but as far as total eradication of pigs with shooting with deer rifles uh, is, is typically not going to be very effective. Uh, at all at removing large numbers of those animals. And we always need to remember, folks, there's no home remedies. And, and I quite frequently have people who come up to me at events and locations and say, man, I found this thing that's just an absolute lights out for pigs. And the first thing I do is, uh, sorry, I need to walk away. I do not want to hear this. Uh, because there's no home remedy that's legal out there. Uh, so keep those home remedies where they belong. If it's in a diesel tank, you keep it in a diesel tank. If it's for anything else, you keep it where it belongs. Those remedies are not legal. Okay, so that's kind of going to wrap up what we needed to talk about as far as the planning and the prepping. The other thing that what we know to do again too is just kind of go back over the schedule that we got coming up. My pigs are different. We're going to be talking about that next month. Uh, that will be a fun one to talk about. Uh, that's something that we really have a lot of fun talking about whenever we're working with groups on educational events and things like that. And I like to hear about it because sometimes some of those differences do exist. That's a very real, a real thing. So uh, we just need to talk about what is true, what's a, maybe a little bit of a myth and uh, and get everybody in the right direction. June's going to be a fun month because we have two events instead of one. Uh, you can see what's there on the schedule for, for the, the one that's scheduled in our typical time. Uh, but the second one in June on the 28th is Dr. Carl Gramsey with the German Forestry Association there is going to be talking with us about, um, about the saturation trapping and the way they approach the African swine fever eradication efforts in Germany. Um, some of y'all may say, well, I couldn't care less about African swine fever eradication, but where I think you can see where this is going to be a major help to you is saturation trapping. If you have the ability to, to overload an area with multiple traps and, and basically create a bullseye and just continue to enlarge that bullseye, saturation trapping is highly effective in doing that. So that will be also a recorded uh, event because, again, too, it will air at 11 o'clock Central Time on the 28th. Uh, but we will record it again, just like what we do with, with all these webinars. We'll record them. Uh, you can come back in and listen to what you what the, the recording said and any of the questions that were answered uh, following that. So with that, what we'll do is I'm going to open it back up. And I think maybe Ryan and Marshall still with us now. Uh, uh, Kayla, I think, is maybe with us. Is the, the questions, if you have them, put them in the chat box. And, and they're going to be um, reading those questions and we're going to take as long as what we need to to answer the questions that you have coming in tonight. So uh, ask them if you got them. All right, we got one sensitive question. How do you go about pricing for trapping? Well, that's I think it's going to vary a lot of places. It's going to depend if it's agriculture locations or if it's re if it's residential or anything like that. I know that there's a uh, trapping is priced on out there. Sometimes um, they price on the number of successful nights. 
And regardless, if you catch one pig or 50, they're going to price according to if it was a successful night or not. Other things are going to be uh, they'll price out as a setup fee. Uh, you'll play a play a flat rate for a setup fee, and then you'll pay by the week or by the month as far as like trap rental fees, things like that. Uh, other places that, that, that I heard as far as trapping and removing of animals is anywhere between uh, 40 and $60 per pig removed. And that's going to be between the trapper and the landowner or the agency or anything like that. But, and, and a lot of people will basically balk pretty heavily at the $40 a pig, but that's something that people need to remember too, what the cost of bait is, what the cost of fuel is. It's not cheap to do that. So the other thing to keep in mind, if you're, if you're providing a service or you're needing a service provided, that the ballpark number that you keep in mind on, on the, uh, the amount of damage per pig per year is around $300. So it, that animal that's allowed to live that that full length of the, the year is going to cost somewhere around $300 per animal. So it doesn't take long before that gets expensive quickly. Um, I will tell you this, if you're, if you're getting services rendered to you as far as somebody coming in to trap for you, I would have... That I would pay that that service based on the number of animals that they can shoot show to you that have been dispatched or have been legally delivered to a holding facility. Uh, I do know that from past experiences, some trappers will have a, a load of live pigs, get paid for them, turn around and go to the back of the property and release them again. Um, if there's rendered services there, I would make sure that those trappers were removing all pigs regardless of size. Uh, because if there's holding facilities that are taking pigs, especially like where we're at here in Texas, uh, they won't take pigs under a certain size. And, and those animals end up getting released in a lot of places. And that's just going to continue the damage. So uh, it's it depends on what side of the aisle you're on as far as if you're providing a service or if you're needing the service. But uh, trapping is is not cheap. Uh, it's 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 very labor intensive. And uh, but as far as labor intensive is concerned, we are a heck of a lot easier to do that with a brig because of how easy it is to set that trap up compared to other trap systems. Hey, I'll jump in there. One other thing to think about is, is the, the population level reduction that you're trying to achieve. So, you know, if you're trying to skim a few pigs off the surface and there's, you know, you don't have, you're not seeing a lot of damage that's a lot less expensive than going in and doing a complete eradication and a fence facility. So um, that really, it's pretty much on a case by case basis when you start looking pricing out, um, you know, the amount per pig. And that's a, a lot of times it'll end up being density dependent if there's, you know, pigs running all over your uh, hunting lease or ranch. Um, the first few pigs that come off the top are really cheap, right? The last one you get's really expensive. So uh, some of it's density dependent, the better data that you have on the population level that you're, you're, you're starting with and where you're trying to go, um, you know, gives you a better, better, better ability to gauge how much it's going to cost per animal. The other thing too, is that it, it's not a one and done type thing. If you go in and you manage this year and you, and, and whether you take them all, a few off the top or you try to take out the, the entire population there, it's not that you do it now and you walk away from it. It doesn't have to be done again, because uh, we've seen it, that you go in and you take out 90% of the pigs out of a given area, then obviously the environment is going to increase in productivity and so forth, food availability, the, the quality of that food availability. So you'll see your litter sizes increase in number. So it's quite likely if you do it one and done, you may have 50 pigs in a given area and you don't do anything. And whenever that population rebounds, it'll rebound to 60. So you need to make sure that you understand that whenever population management is, is implemented, that it's, it's something that's going to be an ongoing uh, effort. So something to keep in mind. I have a question. Are there any plans for working with states to purchase or lease traps to landowners? Um, I don't know if Aaron, if you want to touch on that first, then I can fill in what I know. Or if you want me to yeah, start. and and there, there, and that's a good question. I mean, we do have uh, quite a few states, Texas, Louisiana, Alabama. I think Georgia may be doing a little bit of it now. There is, there's quite a few states out there that either have cost shares uh, that they'll help out with purchase of trap. And I think Kayla, that's what you probably can talk a little bit about, but I know that, that, uh, Louisiana is very heavy, and so is Texas. 
uh, in, in a, a trap loaner or trap rental program, basically through soil and water conservation districts and things like that, that those, those, those availabilities exist. Um, if you're in, an, in a state that does not have that available, then let us know if you've got anybody that's interested in getting that thing kicked off, that we can definitely talk to them about that and, and what works, what doesn't work. But Kayla, if you want to talk to them a little bit about, about what you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just like you said, Texas and Louisiana both have leases or rental programs that they have. Alabama also has that in certain districts or counties, as you call them. Um, but they also have in Alabama, there's a state cost share, like you said, and then they also have funding through the Farm Bill, um, where they're offering cost share for trap purchases to producers in Alabama. And then Georgia is one of the new states they're currently working on trying to get something like that started. So like Aaron said, if you guys have any ideas for the states that you're in, um, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, and if we can help anything like that, let us know where we can help. Any other questions? Yeah, Thanks, Kayla. Um, the biggest drawback I've heard from outsiders about pig brig is that they snare the bucks. How do you deal with deer, particularly bucks? Sure, you bet. Yeah, this is something that, that there's three things that we need to keep in mind with regard to antlered bucks. OK, one thing is, is there is a, a a ideology out there that whenever you go from conditioning to set that you need to incrementally lower that net. That's wrong. OK, so whenever we start thinking about incrementally lowering that net, if that if that deer has acclimated themselves to going into that brig and, and feeding on that bait that you've got, if you gradually lower that net, those animals are still going to continue to try to go under that net. So you either go all the way up or all the way down. The next thing that we want to do is that we want to make sure that we um, bait those traps at the same time of day every day. So your behaviors is going to dictate how those the, the animals around that's going to perform, basically. So if you want to think about how you cube cattle and the, and the cows chase the cube truck around whenever they hear it coming, is the same kind of thing holds true with pigs. If you're going to bait at five o'clock every day at the same time every day, leave the truck running, leave the side by side running, keep the radio playing, keep talking, do what you do, but make a uh, make a consistent habit of what you do baiting. And as those animals can hear that that vehicle fade off in the distance, they know that table is set. So you're going to decrease the amount of time from when you leave there to when pigs show up. Number three is probably the most important thing that we need to keep in mind. Number three is that we do not want to have any bait within the skirting of that net. So whenever you set that trap and that trap is in set mode, we don't want any of the bait within a couple of feet of the skirting of that net or of that, that trap. We want those pigs as they come into that net, we want those pigs to commit to that bait before they get to that to that first kernel of corn. That way there's less likely one that the pigs are gonna back out. The problem with bait in the skirting of the net is that as those deer come into contact with that bait, their heads are gonna be sweeping side to side trying to pick up that bait. And if there's bait in that in the skirting of that net, there's a the more they have to sweep their head to pick up bait in the skirt, then the, the chances of getting tangled with those antlers are, are going to be increased. So the 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 situation that we see with antlered bucks and the and the concerns there, all three of those situations can be uh drastically decreased by human behavior, human activity. So Ryan, and you may have something that we want to add to that as well. Yeah, it's posted in the um chat group there, but uh, we did a blog post on this. Uh, it's probably, I don't know, maybe six months ago, something like that. Uh, title of the blog post was, hey, bub, this is a deer camp. Um, and so it gives you mitigation strategies. You know, one of the things that we consider is this time of year, um, you don't have to worry about antlers so much, but as you start to move into the late summer, antler, antlers start to develop. Um, there's still a lot of food out there for, for deer. Um, just souring the corn may be enough to put them off of your bait. Um, one of the tricks that Aaron taught me was uh, go ahead and mix some rice bran in that and ferment it up when you're souring your corn. And when that really gets stinking, um, that does a pretty good job of keeping the deer away. If you're still having problems, um, you can use uh, concentrated liquid fence. Um, and it's basically just putrefied egg solids or putrescent egg solids. Um, and you can try at the, the, the label rate if uh, there's still quite a bit of natural food out there. And if you get to the point where, you know, you're later into the fall, 
um, you know, getting pretty close to hunting season right around the rut, you'll probably have to use it at two times the label rate to keep the deer off of it just because there's not as much to eat out there and uh, the bucks will be pressed from rut. So they'll be pretty hungry. So, um, but if you, if you check out that blog post or uh, get on, get on our website and look up the blog post, Hey Bub, this ain't deer camp. Um, it talks about a lot of those mitigation strategies. And yeah, one the, other the, thing, go ahead, sorry. No, but Dad, you you just you brought something to mind whenever you brought up about the the rice bran is that whenever we ferment it with rice is is obviously deer love dry rice bran. That's something they'll they'll leave counties to go get. So you want to make sure if you're fermenting your corn with your rice bran that it is fermented because if it's a dry bran, they they'll come from wherever. The other thing that that we hear quite often that people say to keep the deer back is to use diesel. Um, and we definitely do not promote that at all. Uh, diesel was originally used in, in, in around pigs as a, a way for them to alleviate non, um, external parasites. Just like if you see a creosote post or on your electric lines and all that, they're rubbing that petroleum on their bodies to get rid of the external parasites. Well, people have got the in their mind that they ferment their, their corn with diesel and it keeps the, the deer back. Well, it keeps the pigs back too. So what you need to kind of keep in mind is, is that pigs have the same monogastric digestive system that we do and petroleum in a monogastric system does not do well. And any of y'all that have sucked too hard on a siphon hose can attest to that. The other thing to keep in mind though about the diesel is that diesel is a soil contaminant. Diesel is a water contaminant. So we definitely uh, don't want to, we don't want to use the diesel in that. Other than that, though, too, is that I've watched deer stand over the top of corn soaked in diesel and eat every kernel of it if it's in a hard time of the year where they're drought stressed or something like that. So if there is nothing out there on the landscape, whatever you put on the ground, the animals are going to eat it. So um, leave the diesel in the diesel tanks, leave it in the in the tractors, leave it wherever else, but don't put it on the ground for pigs. Yeah, and I think I'll add to that as well. Uh, you know, the National Deer Association uses our traps. So, you know, if it's good enough for them, it's probably good enough for anybody. Um, there's a, in the chat function, there's a YouTube video. Uh, Vicki posted it up there um, that the National Deer Association talks about using our traps. And uh, yeah, you got to be careful. You got to use mitigation strategies, but uh, deer get hung up in all kinds of stuff, right? I'm usually cutting out two or three deer a year that get caught up in badminton netting, volleyball netting, Christmas tree lights, trout Home lines. buckets, trout, trout lines. lines. You, yep. Yeah, you name it, they get hung up in it. They get hung up together, right? Um, <laughs> you know, when they get all wound up, they stick their antlers and anything and everything. So um, definitely, you know, and a lot of people that time of year, um, you know, will, will slow down on the trapping, right? They're focused on hunting anyways. And wait until it gets a little later in the year when the, the deer are starting to drop their antlers anyways. They're starting to shed. So. Uh, Aaron, you touched on this a minute ago, but what are some alternative hog baits or feeds that deer and raccoons will not eat? Well, one is that Ryan spoke about it there just really quickly there in that last conversation is that that deer have shown us in, in, in studies or that they don't like that emulsified egg solid. So like the the putrefied egg and liquid fence, they don't like that. Um, some of the things that that I would think about as far as deer and and keeping those deer back is one, you're going to think about your your egg solids. Number two, they don't like anything hot. Uh, so deer will, will tend to, to shy away from anything hot. Coons will do the same thing. They don't like anything hot either. I mean, a coon that has the, does not have the ability to, to produce saliva. So anything that they get in there that's dry, extremely dry uh, or hot, they're going to be looking for water. They don't care for that as well. Uh, but what I'll do if I'm, I'm thinking about trying to keep deer pushed back, I'm going to use the, the liquid fence. I'm going to use the, 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 the rice bran fermented in corn. So you put a, about basically the, the, the conversion is, is you put about five pounds of rice bran in with about 50 pounds of corn whenever you're fermenting it and, and make sure you let it ferment for four or five days. Um, and the deer do not like the fermented rice bran. Uh, so that's going to be something that's, that's, that will work for your deer. Coons absolutely despise any anything to do with fermented rice bran. They they don't care for it at all. Um, one of the things as far as trying to to get pigs on bait, I'm not and Marshall and y'all are aware of it. I'm not really so much a fan of 
of additives and attractants. If you need them and you trust them, use them. I don't have a problem with it. But if I'm going to be looking at trying to draw pigs and and keep um, the, the, the pigs there quickly to try to minimize the time the deer have access, I haven't seen anything better than buttermilk. Uh, buttermilk is absolutely phenomenal. It's got a sweet taste, sweet smell, and uh, and those pigs absolutely love it. One of the things that I'll do, too, to try to draw pigs quicker, because the quicker pigs can get there, the less likely you're going to have issues with non-target species, is I will take uh, a fermented bait and may only have a coffee can full of it where I'm using dry corn for the, the actual baiting procedure, but I'll take a coffee can full of fermented bait and I'll soak it with a rag or a sponge or something like that and lay it up on the top of the trap cap and let the wind disperse the smell throughout the, the landscape. And uh, and it, and it uh, gets to the pigs a heck of a lot quicker than just throwing fermented bait on the ground. But corn, in the, in the times of the year like we're at right now, whenever there's plenty out there for the deer to eat, uh, corn, fermented corn deer really doesn't care for that. So right now you probably able to keep your deer pushed back, uh, relatively well with your fermented corn. So, uh, Ryan, what else have you seen out there? Yeah, I think you hit the major ones, right? Um, yeah, the, the, you know, we get some other things that, um, are a little harder to manage, right? It's, um, because pigs are uh, omnivore, um, they'll eat, you know, we've had customers call in that bait their traps with dead chickens because they live near a, a broiler house, right? Um, right? Deer obviously don't care for that, but then you have every cat in the neighborhood prowling around wild dogs and all kinds of stuff. So, um, you know, the other one, uh, someone posted it in the chat, but um, if you dust your corn with blood meal, that helps. But if you get humidity and in two or three days, it's going to stink the high heavens and keep everything back. Um, well, and that's a good also, point, too. Yeah. One of the things, too, Ryan, that we did last fall, we looked at blood meal. And with the other one that we looked at was bone meal. Do not use bone meal. There was nothing in the woods that liked bone meal, anything to do with it, because it stinks even far worse than blood meal does. Uh, the raccoons didn't want it. The pigs didn't want it. The bear didn't even want it. Uh, so if it's a, if you ferment your corn in, in anything to do with bone meal, uh, I promise you, you don't even want to visit the trap site to bait it. it it's It's pretty bad. We did have Marshall. Yep. Go ahead, Caleb. Oh, a couple of people uh, mentioned that Mississippi does have one of those trap loan programs that they're running through the Department of Ag. Um, but they said that with running them, they're running into a situation with sporadic visits. Visits, excuse me. Hogs are here a couple of nights and then gone a couple, and then they'll come back maybe in a week. Are there any thoughts on how to get consistent visits? Well, one of the things on consistent visits is going to be looking at what other commodities are available to them. If there's any other agriculture product production that's going on in the area, then they're going to be scattered across that landscape and taking advantage of all that. Uh, other things that right now will scatter pigs is if you got blackberries that are getting ripe. Uh, we've got we'll watch uh, pigs just literally grazing over the top of ripe blackberries, and uh, and they're they're going to be over a vast area taking advantage of just unbelievably uh, highly nutritious food. And whenever we compare that to corn, your corn protein is about nine percent. It's high fat. It's not really a good nutritious uh, food source for pigs. Um, but if there's nothing else out there, absolutely, they're going to gravitate to it. So depending on the time of the year, what other your other natural availabilities are that's out there, then uh, then they're they're going to come in pretty dang quick um, to to corn, basically in your winter time of the year, your hard time of the year that's drought stress, so forth and so on. Other folks that I've seen what they use to, to increase the nutrition of the food. Uh, at trap sites is use uh, sweet feed. You can get sweet feed at your local feed store. You can get it at Tractor Supply, anywhere there that sells a, just a generic sweet feed. And it's got a molasses base to it. It's got more of a grain type base to it. And it's, uh, it's, it's sweeter for them than just your standard corn. But the thing is, is that if they're inconsistent now, that's not gonna, that pattern will not hold. That inconsistency will break as soon as they start to deplete those natural food availabilities, and they will come to back to those those baits, those bait sites, those those trap sites. So, please, please, please be patient. Um, that doesn't matter the trap technology. That's just animal behavior. If they've got plenty to eat, they're going to scatter across the landscape until that that cornucopia is gone, and then they'll be back to you. So. Just keep watching them. Keep those nets conditioned set and, and just keep watching. The other thing to keep in mind with baiting 
is it whenever we set a trap up and it doesn't matter the technology. So whenever I say setting a trap up and we're baiting it, I'm obviously going to be talking about pig brig, but it holds true for all technologies. We see a lot of people that'll put the traps up and immediately, as soon as those traps get put up, they put all the bait in the center of that trap. And then they wonder why if the pigs were coming to a bait pile, they automatically quit. Well, if you put up a big trap in an area that hasn't had one before, those pigs are going to be aware. You're, you're working with an extremely smart animal. And, and whenever you put up a trap in an area that that trap has not been there before, those pigs may flare on you for a little bit. So for me, what I do to try to keep the consistency there without forcing those pigs to where they don't need to be is I'll put that trap up and up and I'll put about 90% of the bait on the outside of the trap with 10% on the inside. And by doing this, what you're doing is, is early on, you're just introducing that pig to that trap and you're not forcing them to go where they don't want to go. So as those, once those pigs eat that 10% of the bait on the inside of the trap, then 100% goes to the inside. But I never, ever, ever start with all the bait in the inside of that trap until those pigs have shown me they're not afraid of it and, uh, and they, they respond quicker. Uh, someone asked, can you use a creosote log in the trap instead of bait? Absolutely. Yes. I've done that many times before. Uh, uh, I guess if you want to call it in a former life, I lived down on the Texas coast and there was a lot of rice around us. So we had about a quarter million acres of row crop and a lot of rice. So we had plenty of food, but with rice, we had plenty of bugs. So what I've caught pigs do exclusively using a post and if it's a creosote post that's cut off from the electric co-op, that's great. What I did, though, is I took the like an eight-foot uh, wooden fence post, and I wrapped a rug around that eight-foot wooden fence post, and I poured fish grease or fry grease on there. And that fish and fry grease serves the same purpose as the creosote post does with removing those external parasites, but with that fish grease and fry grease on there, it's an attractant, too, because it smells like food. So... The reason I say that I use that more often than I do a creosote post is, is that what we found is that if you've got animals that are rubbing on a creosote post or on a burnt motor oil rag, we have found that there's been residues that shown up in the meat of that animal after prolonged rubbing on that burnt motor oil or on that creosote post. So if you're going to be using that pig for freezer material to put on a barbecue pit or something like that, then I'd be a little bit more hesitant to put something out there that could leach through their skin and get into their muscle tissue. But fish grease and fry grease, perfectly harmless, and those pigs will come to it quickly and it serves the same purpose. There That's a good question. question. Very good there, question. There was another question, but it it went away, but they were asking, um, where's the best place to find um, processing places for pigs? That's a, yeah, and it's going to be kind of tough to tell you by state because it's a big, big area. But one of the things that you need to check with is it with your individual state health agencies. Uh, if you're at the state level, some of those state health agencies require those wild game processors to register with the state. So they have to have... Yes, they have to register with the state. They have to have permits in place and things like that. So that would probably be your quickest place to start locating is, is with your departments of ag or your department of health in your particular state and ask them uh, where those, those, those establishments are. Because if they're permitted, that means they're inspected. So you don't have to worry about um, something that being there that's pretty unsanitary. All right, we had another question up kind of towards the top. Could you tell us more about what Germany is doing with organized campaigns to trap pigs and have any states or counties in the U.S. tried anything similar? Well, what Germany's doing is, is that um, obviously there's a situation there with African swine fever in, in the European Union. And, and where the concern is, is that, I mean, African swine fever is not harmful to humans. Where the situation is with African swine fever is that it's, it could be catastrophic with the economy of domestic pork trade. Uh, so what has to happen with that, uh, that African swine fever is you completely keep it out of, of the domestic population at all costs. So what happens with, with disease, disease eradication is typically disease, I guess, prevalences show up in hot spots. So what will happen in those hot spots is they'll go into, the, into an area where there's been positive cases, uh, much like with what's going on now with, with chronic wasting disease in deer in the United States. But whereas here they use the 
uh, uh, they don't use nets to go in to control that. And in the pig situation is they'll go into an area and use saturation trapping where there's been positive cases or a hot zone, and they'll do a total eradication of that area, and they'll move those nets out from basically a bullseye concentration area and move those nets out in increasing si and cr increasing distances from that original uh, hot area to where they can make a, a, a bigger buffer zone and uh, and and not have to worry about getting as close proximity to domestic swine production. So where that's going to be helpful with us in the United States and saturation trapping is that if you've got lactating sows or sows that have pigs on side, they're not going to go into a trap with a boar hog in there. They're just not going to do that. So if you have a high boar population in an area and you've got a lot of females that's got pigs on side and you want to and you want to catch those animals in a very short duration. Uh, is you put multiple traps in a given area where if a sow with a bunch of pigs goes to a trap and there's a boar already there, she doesn't have to travel very far to get to the next trap where there's an open open trap there where, where she can get those pigs in there without having to worry about boar interference. So saturation trapping can help in a lot of, a lot of places um, that, that are not specifically disease focused. But what they'll do in, in, in Germany is they'll take those nets once they've trapped a given area, they'll take those nets and, and literally backpack those out of there, hang them up in trees and, and not too far from that that uh, initial location, and they'll go back to trapping that area. Uh, but yeah, Ryan, you can talk probably more to it as far as the what's going on in Germany, but based on what what has happened in in, uh, in Guam. No, it's it's basically just just how you described it, um, you know, and it's it's. If we ran into the same situation here in the States, we would be attacking it very similarly, right? It's like now there's a lot of effort going into um, reducing the number of feral swine. But if it starts to impact our, our livestock industry, that changes the whole game, right? It's like you're right. going to get billions and billions of dollars pumped into solving it because it, it'd be catastrophic. So. Yeah, and that's the situation is I think if the number that I heard that they're trying to 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 keep alive in Germany is that the, the pork export uh, the pork export coming out of Germany uh, if the number I, I remember is correct is about 6 billion a year. And and that's that's in addition to what they feed the what the population eats there um in Germany already. So if they're looking at a, at a single test case that comes up positive in domestic pork, they're going to have to depopulate that 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 pork, and then also too whatever's remaining, there's going to be a a cease and desist on any kind of export coming out of there with pork. And we've seen this as several years back. Whenever you think about the BSE, the the mad cow disease, the bon, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, is is whenever something like that happens then it shuts everything down and it's catastrophic to the economy. It's catastrophic to food safety in the minds of the, the common citizen out there. And it takes years and years and years to recover. So the best way to do that is to avoid the initial uh, infection. And by doing that, you have to go in and, and take care of population management. One of the big things too, Ryan, that we need to, to keep in mind that, that what's going on in Germany that's a little bit different from here is in Germany though, those pigs are native. That's a game species over there. So we have to think about laws, game laws, and how we have to navigate those game laws with with the eradication permits and, and depredation things and that, like that is it's not just like what we have here in the United States where we got a pig issue and just go out and catch pigs and take care of it on your own. You've got some other things that you have to check the boxes on where those pigs are native. Good questions though. Anything else? Looks like Chad posted in there. Any ideas on how to make my corn more in the trap more attractive than the freshly planted corn in the fields that pigs are rooting up? That's a tough and, one. And that's and and the way that I've seen that, and that's a very that's a very good one, very common one, uh, Chad. Is that that what we hear quite often? It, and one that and like I said, I'm not a big fan of additives and attractants, but I will tell you this is that I've had multiple successes by using bu uh, buttermilk on top of corn right next to your planted corn rows. It's a sweet taste. It's a sweet smell. It's something new to them. It makes that corn a lot more palatable because that buttermilk will soak into that corn. Uh, you can, I mean, even as you approach the trap, you can smell it yourself. Um, other things that I will think about is that um, sometimes you can smell like inoculants on seed and it smells like certain flavorings. 
And if you can smell whatever the inoculant smells like there in that cornfield, try to find something there that you can add to it, whether it's a Kool-Aid powder that's going to closely mirror what that inoculant smells like, because that's what the theory is, is that those pigs can smell the inoculant in the ground. And that's what they're targeting. It's not the fact that they feed on the inoculant. It's the fact that it's a new smell in the ground. And pigs are very, very curious animals. And they're going to root that, that seed up just to see what the heck is there. And then whenever they get it rooted up, they're like, oh, there's corn. I'm going to go ahead and eat it. So that's the that's something if you can find what can smell most closely to your inoculants, then, then that's going to be a game changer for you. The other thing out there is going to be, again, too, buttermilk. Uh, absolutely can't say enough about super easy to get your hands on it. And it's very, very consistent. You don't have to worry about a recipe you're trying to put together. I think Anything that's else? it. None? Oh, wait, we got one more. Okay. Question, maybe not a pertinent to tonight's topic, so I can call call it in if deemed more appropriate. If one would like to establish initial communication with pertinent government entities, APHIS, state, ag department, et cetera, in order to explore more feasibility of collaboration and or nesting one's efforts with them, might you have the on the ground POCs that cover the lower Rio Grande Valley counties here in South Texas? Well, one of the things, I mean, being from Texas and now, and, and prior to Pig Brig, I worked for Texas A&M um, through the extension services, is that you need to, to work closely with your, your soil water conservation districts. Uh, soil and water conservation has an outstanding uh, record, track record of being able to stay very, very closely affiliated with your legislators and things of that nature. Another one that is there that's an unbelievably great voice for agriculture across the whole United States is your farm bureaus. Uh, talk to those farm bureaus. They know who to talk to, your specific representatives and things of that nature. Um, depending on if you're in other states, uh, is is talk to, you have a, some states have a rural caucus, a rural legislative caucus. And, uh, and that rural legislative caucus is basically the way they vet out what needs to make it on to the full legislature and, and see what's pertinent to those, to those uh, given areas. But if you're down in the valley, I know you're in the, you're in the vegetable garden, the absolute uh, mecca of, of production uh, for the state of Texas. And, uh, and it's super, super um, lucrative by acre. So yeah, what I would do is I would start out working with your individual farm bureau, your individual soil and water conservation district, uh, convey to them what the concerns are. But, um, and then also too, if there's any way that we can help out with the education side of it, uh, the, the, the beautiful thing about Pig Brig is, is that we're gonna have scientific based information that we're gonna convey that we depend on. It's not a, a, a pseudoscience type deal, deal that we can, we can try to talk to the, to the individuals that are out there and explain where the situations lie as far as detrimental impacts. Uh, but if you're in Texas, though, you're down on the Rio Grande, I can uh, promise you, you have an outstanding group of county extension agents down there that will know how to get in touch with Dr. David Anderson. You need to talk to him at Texas A&M University, and he has uh, several years worth of data that's collected on the e economic impact of pigs by commodity. So he can tell you by commodity how much pig damage is affiliated with corn, how much pig damage is affiliated with cotton, so forth and so on. That's something you're going to have to have in your in your tool chest whenever you start talking about pigs and the importance is if you can assign that dollar value to it. And Dr. Anderson has done that. All right, that's it for questions. Good deal. If anybody has any additional ones, you can always call us at 833 Pig Brig. That's 833 744 2744. Sorry, I'm still trying to learn everything. There you go. Yeah. And always, too, email us at info at pigbrig.com. If you've got any other ideas that we need to put on the, on the roster for upcoming webinars, or if there's a specific question we need to address during the during the webinar that's coming up. So definitely stay in contact with us and we'll make sure that it stays on the hot button. Other than that, folks, I, I appreciate you uh, spending your time with us. And uh, as always, give us a call if we can help you.